Welcome back to the On Deck Circle Podcast. I am your handsome host, Nick Z, and I am here with my buddy Jason. And Jason, we are not alone today. We, we're having a threesome this evening. And that third willing party is none other than Mr. Jesse Roach. Jesse, how are you this evening? I'm well. Excited to be on the podcast. And uh, I'll, I won't spoil what we'll talk about, but uh, it's one of my favorite topics. So excited to talk at length. Uh, within reason about all these players. <laughs> yep, we'll try and tie it in about forty-five minutes ish. That's yes. uh, because my bedtime is approaching. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so Jesse, we do have this thing called the cold open quest- question of the week, which we briefly just spoke spoke about off air for those that are watching. Uh, this this week's question has to do with my life because last week I had a bed frame break <laughs> in my apartment. Speaking of threesomes, <laughs> would love to have a cool story. Nope, my 185 pound ass sat on it to put away a t shirt, fell completely broke. That's what you get for IKEA. It's been like eight, eight years long. So, I want to know from you guys what is the worst piece of furniture to put together? All right, ready, set, go. Uh, let's start with the guest. So, Jesse, let me uh, hear, just in your honest opinion, the worst piece of furniture to put together. You know, a bed frame is a great one, a great choice. They suck. Uh, but, you know, I think kitchen islands, okay, they're not really enjoyable either. There's surprisingly a lot of parts for ch- kitchen islands. They're very useful once put together, but they take hours. Yep. They say they'll take an hour, but they do not. Nope. Ever. Jason? I got to go with uh, dressers. 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 Okay. Yep. They got like, you know, five to seven drawers. The drawers are always a pain in the ass. You got to put the little yeah. little rails on there and stuff. And then make sure the drawers are all lined, lined, up, lined up nicely. I'm going to say uh, drawers or uh, dressers as my yep. uh, my uh, worst. Oh, so just I just put together. We, we, sorry. Me <laughs> and my wife just put together the new bed frame that arrived today. So we got one that's supposed to take five minutes to install, five minutes to put together. It did not take five minutes. It took maybe 25, which is still great. But um, this is me trying to get a promo. Shout out to Thuma. If you're out there listening, Thuma, I am a Thuma user. And if you want to give me a free bed, bed frame, I will take another one. I don't know what Thuma is. You just turned me on to something. I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's it's uh, they're used Japanese linkage. It, it's basically like a Lincoln log bed, but okay. it's very hard wood. I'll send nice. you guys my my uh, promo link later. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah. Like I said, then got here a uh, special guest here. Jesse Roach joins the show again today. Um, you can find Jesse Roach on Twitter. I believe it's at J A Roach six or O six, uh, something like that. Um, does really great work over at Baseball Prospectus. Why don't you let us know what you got going on, Jesse? Uh, Right now, we're still plowing ahead with the positional series for dynasty purposes, or just all fantasy positional series, but I focus, obviously, on the dynasty aspects of that. Uh, That's basically the rest of the preseason until we hit late, mid to late March, and then the big rankings come out. Top 500 dynasty rankings, top 500 dynasty prospects, and the season starts March 20th, so those rankings may be coming out. Uh, even after the season starts this year, because the seasons that that random series in what uh, Korea to start to start mm-hmm. the year. So, but yeah, yeah, lots, I'm lots pumped. Of content. <laughs> yeah, I'm pumped to have Jesse on. He's, I mean, I like everything that you bring, the insights you bring on the players, especially the minor league systems like that. I, I mean, I find you super knowledgeable. I love your insights. I'm super stoked to have you on the show here today. We're talking about first year player draft, must have players. This is like. 
like you said, off air. This is your this is your bread and butter. This is your favorite topic. Um, this is great stuff. We're in that season right now. A lot of dynasty uh, leagues are starting up shortly here. A lot of them start off with that first year player draft, depending on what league you're in. Um, I feel like generally consensus this is the the season for first year player draft. I know we're having a few first year player drafts going on currently, so glad to have you on the show today. Glad to be here. All right, before we get into all the good uh, stuff, let's take care of the business side of things. Do you want to get access to the most accurate fantasy baseball rankings according to Fantasy Pros? Do you want to get draft cheat sheets, DFS, and betting projections? Custom league advice in our Discord. One of my favorite things is our Discord. Um, you can do more and all of that by signing up to become an all-access member today at fantasysixpack.net forward slash plans. And right now, currently, we have a promo. You can use promo code F6PMLB24 to save 15% off today. I think that may have been the fastest I've done that because I just want to get into the good stuff. Who cares about the... No, I'm just kidding, Joe. But, uh, <laughs> all right. So, I think before we get into really get down to some players, I think before we start, is there, I think just off the cuff, is there like, do you have a general strategy when it comes to first year player drafts? It really depends on the year, honestly. Uh, I tend to, in dynasty leagues, use prospects and picks as capital to upgrade my major league roster. So I'm always doing that generally, but this is very much a loaded first year player draft class it up really even for deep, deep leagues. If you're in a 30 teamer, you're going to find fantastic talent all the way up to like pick 100. You'll find some really good players, uh, but generally in first year player drafts, it does depend on the year. In this one, I think that the very top is obviously fantastic, but I think there's a ton of value to be found. I mean, depending upon what league size you're in, if you're in like a 12-team league, that entire first and second round may just be a bunch of players who conceivably could be top 100 prospects uh, for fantasy purposes. I think I have 17 players in this draft class in my top 100, which I've never done before for first year after a first-year player um, draft class. It's it's pretty remarkable how deep it is and how much elite talent there is as well. But generally, again, in first-year player drafts, uh, I kind of want to be aggressive. I'll try and target uh, different tier groupings. If I'm, I'll be monitoring the draft, and if I think that a player or players are falling, I will try to aggressively move up. And uh, if I don't, if I think there's just a nice group of players available, I'll try and move down. I think that you should try to take advantage of people trying to chase after their players and, and move down in first year player drafts to try and get some more draft capital. And I think this is a great one to do that in trading down. Uh, if you're in like that mid range this year, I think it's not a bad idea, but again, that mid range is fantastic. So trade downs are not necessarily advisable this year. It's just, it's a crazy draft class. Crazy. It's almost, it's so crazy that it's hard to really give great strategy for this specific class because sure. you could do anything to maximize your draft class, your draft capital, just get picks. Like, mm -hmm. That's the biggest advice this year. Get as many picks as possible. That's a, that's a solid advice. Like I said, I think you always got to go every year of different strategies, whether it be, um, you know, win now or, you know, get some of those deeper, you know, get, compile all those draft picks and stuff like that so all right so let's get into some of these topics here we got laid out here i think if let's get right off the bat and just go with some of the you know most people are singing after and that's maybe some of the more you know over and undervalued players um in this year's draft and let's start off here with um so maybe some 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 one or two guys maybe you think that might be getting a little overvalued here right now maybe going a little bit higher than you think that the the skill set shows I'll go for a player that you've listed on this as potentially being undervalued. And that's Nolan Shanuel. Uh, I think that Nolan Shanuel is getting overvalued, especially in deeper formats. You know, people are chasing the proximity and the fact that he obviously was a rare talent that actually arrived at the major league level, held his own uh, over that, you know, his brief sample with the Angels. He's likely going to be opening the year as they're starting first baseman. So for those who are trying to win now, it makes some sense to try and target him. Um, I would not touch him anywhere near like a top 10 pick, for example, it, regardless of format. I just don't think that the impact is good there. I don't think it's going to be there. Um, he, I believe Baseball America last year put out an article that had him as the lowest bat speed of any player in Major League Baseball last year, lower than players like Luis Arise, um, 
lower than any of all those weak power hitters. And I don't really think that the low power numbers we saw from him last year were all that fluky. And my biggest concern with Shanuel is, well, obviously he's has very good bat to ball skills, very good plate discipline. I think some people may even put like a seven on the hit tool. I don't think it's that rich. I don't even think it's a seven. I don't think it's, it may not even be a six, you know, given that his quality of contact is so poor generally. I think that you may be disappointed about what kind of average or OBP ultimately puts out year to year. He kind of strikes me as like a dark Barton type, you know, who will have his moments. Like, I think he will have his moments. It could be soon even. He could have some quality years very quickly, but you know, the upside is just not very high. You know, we're talking about a player who may get to like 10-ish, 10 to 15 maybe home runs and hit 270, 280, something like that with a strong OBP, mind you. I think in OBP formats, he gets a slight boost. But, you know, if you're adding slugging to the mix too, I think it dings him heavily. I mean, last year, his obviously his slugging percentage was far lower than his OBP. So he's my biggest, I think, player that I'd be fading generally. Um, but, you know, again, I don't dislike him at all. I just think mm-hmm. he got a place of proper value on him. He's sort of one of those high floor, extremely low ceiling players. And again, in, in deeper formats, like in a third teamer, I'm not opposed to taking him, especially if there's a need, because, you know, you're chasing talent. You're chasing at bats and plate appearances at, for your major league roster. So I don't mind it, but he'd be one of the ones that I'd say would be overvalued, that I've seen to be overvalued at this point. No, I totally agree, and I think you maybe uh, helped Nick um, persuade his uh, his thinking on what he what he what he did earlier, or I think it was yesterday, maybe. So yeah, it's fine. I might have <laughs> picked him at exactly ten, but it's a third. <laughs> I needed a first baseman. So Look, I'm, again, a thirty team league, mind you. Yeah. yeah, you know it has OBP and slugging, so yeah, yeah. you know it kind of he gets a boost in OBP, but gets dinged in slugging. But in a thirty teamer, I do not. I'm not opposed to taking him there, but there you definitely left some talent on the board that I would one thousand far prefer to him. But I get it. Yes. Yeah, I mean that was the thinking when he took it. I think was again thirty teamer. You need need um, proximity. I think was the biggest ish, the biggest need at that 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 pick for you, Nick. I believe was that the reason taking that pick. But yeah, I, I agree with um, you, Jesse. I think there's just not a lot. I think even the counting stats are not there for um, a Nolan. Um, I think again, you're going to get the OEP, and that's probably going to get the power's not going to be there, um, and, and that's just not something I'm I, in, like a 12 or 15 teamer. Yeah, that's a top first round, not at all. I don't think I'd be reaching for him first round at all. All right, let's jump over here then. Um, do you have anybody else, or do you want to jump over to the uh, undervalued? Uh, you know, I actually think that a lot of people are valued fairly. Again, it's such a loaded draft yeah. class that I, I don't think that I've seen anything really stand out in terms of people draft over drafting. I think that if you're doing like a re like a startup draft, you're going to see the very wild differenti- different mm-hmm. differentials yeah. in rankings. Like you're going to see players like Imanaga and Lee get taken way earlier than they have any right to be taken because of you know, they're going to be contributing to your major league roster right away. So I think players like that, I guess, are probably overrated as well in, you know, startup drafts uh, because, you know, they, Lee, all right, I'll just, Lee, how about this? Jung-ho Lee, I think he's overrated. I think that his impact is similar to Shanuel. I just don't think there's a lot of power at all. And what power he does have, he hits everything on the ground. So he's going to have no game power. And he hits in a park that nukes lefty power generally. It's gotten better over the years, but still not a favorable park to hit in for a lefty. You know, he'll hit lead off. He'll get runs. He's going to hit for a high average. He has fantastic back to ball ability. Some of the best, honestly, in the world. But I think what he kind of, his profile is kind of like Luisa Rise. So you're kind of hoping that's what he develops into. And I think hoping for that upside, especially if you're in like an OBP league where someone like Arise actually plays down, um, or if you're in a league that adds like slugging, for example, I just think Lee's going to get dinged some. And, you know, yeah, he's a good runner. He can play center field, but he doesn't steal bases. He stole 10 bases over the last few years collectively in, in the KBO. I don't think he's going to steal it in Major League Baseball at all. I just there will be some maybe. I, I'll, no stealing is not not going to happen. But I don't expect him to be like a twenty stolen base player. So if you think he could be like Stephen Kwan, I, even that might be a bit of a stretch. You know, while he might be Kwan at the plate, I don't think he's going to get you twenty stolen bases. So 
I think he's being overrated a little bit too because I just don't think there's a ton of offensive upside. Now that yeah. said, I do like him. I like him. I think his value in redraft formats where I've seen him drafted is actually quite good. I mean, I, would, I think he should probably go like 250-ish in redraft and he's getting taken way behind that. So I like him for that purpose. And Imanaga as well. You know, I like mm. Imanaga, Imanaga a lot, but he kind of is... If you can, if you go into it expecting Nestor Cortez, then I think you'll be happy because I think that's sort of what he is. He has very similar fastball characteristics to Cortez. Uh, his breaking balls, I think, have a little more upside, but he's also 30 years old, so I think that he could age poorly quickly. Uh, so that's the other concern I'd have. So, you know, I like them both. I think they're going to be quality players right away, and I love their redraft value. But I think in Dynasty and for as a prospect within this loaded first-year player draft, I think we need to be pump the brakes a little bit about where we're drafting them necessarily. That said, you know, I think they're both players I would consider at the very back end of the top 10. Mm-hmm. Um, very back end. But Again, depends on team need. And I definitely would understand a 30-teamer because they're players that are going to immediately slot into a lineup. Yeah, I think with a lot of those, you know, a lot of those guys get a little bit uh, helium on their name just because of the proximity, right? They're going to come in, they're going to make an immediate impact, and, and they might may not be as good as some of the guys that, will, you know, in a few years when they get to develop out of the minor leagues. Uh, so people obviously reach a little bit more on those immediate impact uh, players. One name that I don't know if it's necessarily overvalued, but I think a name that's been getting a lot of helium and rising the ranks and, and even like the draft boards is uh, Herschel Waldrip. Um, love the player. I've seen him now getting up into that like easily top 10 now lately. Uh, I think when we first, you know, we did, I think we did a mock draft back like right after the MLB draft and he was falling into like the second round, which obviously is a lot of that could be expected just because people don't maybe not know the profile or the name or, or, what, or what have you. But he's one of those players that I, I love Waldrip. I'm all in one drip, but right now I think he's, you know, right around that like eight or nine ADP. And that's, that's pretty high for a, a pitching prospect. I'll be a college arm, but yeah. It's a good point. It's a good point. My biggest problem with Waldrop is I think it's fastball. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone loves it because it's hard. He throws a hard, right? But it has terrible shape. It's shape that will not miss bats. He's not going to miss bats with his fastball like at all. Uh, it has, it's almost has cutter like shape. You know, pitchers with that type of shape, lean heavily on their secondaries. Luckily, he could easily do that. It's not an issue for him. But his fastball shape's bad. And I think the one positive about that fastball shape is it's not like dead zone shape. You know, it's the shape that will actually induce ground balls. So it should help manage contact, but it's not going to help him miss bats. But yeah, the slider and obviously the splitter are, you know, amazing pitches. They're great pitches. I think the slider is actually very underrated i think that that's maybe as good as a splitter and i think at the major league level once he gets once he gets in through the system i think that those two pitches if he leans heavily on them he could be quite good i kind of see him as like a kyle bradish type um i think that's what he could be because okay. they have similar fastball issues and crazy breaking secondaries um mm-hmm. kyle bradish so uh obviously bradish is not a person you want to comp anyone to right now given his <laughs> injury but uh that's sort of what i think he could be obviously bradish also had uh command issues when he was younger so uh waldrop's command issues are extreme though so uh, that is a huge question i think he's a starter but it's going to be a volatile profile and i don't think the braves are necessarily going to be willing to lean on him as soon as some people think i think that some people have him being an impact player this year mm-hmm. i would not count on that at all yeah i think you know like you said at the braves right everyone sees the he was drafted by a, a, an organization like the braves that can develop the pitching and then, and then that's automatically you know catapults his rankings and, and his his value because they see him going to a, a system like the braves and you're right that's like um they they don't have a need for him. I mean, they do, but at the proximity that most people think, I don't think they're going to be rushing him to the majors. They want to want to get him refined and that control refined before they let him loose at the major league level. All right, so let's jump over here now. Maybe there's a couple of players that are being maybe undervalued that you could see maybe going outside like the top. You know, it doesn't have to be any certain number, but just guys that you see, you know, maybe falling through the cracks. Sure. Uh... I guess it depends on where you look. Uh, someone like a Walker Martin is undervalued in some circles, but obviously some people are incredibly high on him. So uh, I don't think he necessarily would count. Um, I would say someone like, 
let me see. Uh, it's funny because I'm always just like looking through, thinking about where other people are ranking people and knowing that certain people are really high on them. So I can't list them. I think Ty Floyd. Uh, Ty Floyd is a pitching prospect that was drafted by the Cincinnati Reds. Uh, he was electric in the College World Series last year uh, against some very good squads. He's the type of pitching prospect that is a modern pitching development dream. The biggest issue with Floyd is obviously landed with the Reds. The Reds have actually done a decent job of developing arms like him, but pitching in Great American Ballpark is not ideal. <laughs> I think no Reds pitcher is projected for an ERA below four this year. Uh, so that gives you a context for why you know projection systems hate hate a landing mm -hmm. spot like that. Of course, because he's with the Reds doesn't mean he's going to stay with the Reds, right? Uh, that, that said, I really love the profile. I think he has the best fastball in the draft, better than Paul Skeens. I think it's better, obviously, than Hurston Waldrop, who I don't like his fastball very much. Uh, it's, uh, I think, a seven. I think it's a pure seven. It has great velocity. It has fantastic shape. It's one of those shape shapes that have about 20 inches of induced vertical break. It's a, a bat missing pitch. I think it would probably comp somewhat similar to like Taj Bradley's fastball. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great pitch. It's fantastic. And his secondaries are not bad either. Um, and I think I mentioned Taj Bradley. I kind of think he is a lot similar with like Bryce Miller. Uh, mm -hmm. I think he has that type of uh, upside that he could do that pretty quickly too you know once they kind of get his secondaries honed a little bit you know the reds have done a pretty good job of developing breaking balls uh, with a lot of their arms and that's something that he has shown promise with so i think there's a chance that his slider becomes like a, a plus pitch even in that development organization um whether he can truly get to a viable changeup. i mean i think some people think he could get to average it could I mean, the Reds have not really shown that they've been able to develop changeups that well. I mean, obviously, we've seen what happened with what's happening with uh, Hunter Green, who's now trying to add a splitter. There isn't, they haven't just not been able to do it. Um, so I'm not super confident that that will happen. But even with those, with a fastball and a slider, like I think it can be, I think he'll be a very good pitcher. And I think that, I mean, that's very similar to what Bryce Miller is right now. He doesn't have a really, truly viable changeup. So. Yeah, I really like Ty Floyd. I think he's undervalued. I shouldn't be saying this because I really want to love to draft him in 30 Rock, but <laughs> I have a, my next pick's like way, way far away, so I'm not anticipating uh, being able to get someone like him. Well, well, maybe you'll be able to pick before this this comes out tomorrow. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, one guy that I've been on since being drafted, I think we talked talk about him when we had our show with Chris, uh, Colton Ledbetter of, um, from Tampa, out of Mississippi State. I think um, he has the ability to, um, to to make some um, you know, rise some rankings this year. Uh, I think he's been someone that's not really been talked about enough. I thought he had a really good uh, 2023 at Mississippi State. Um, but yeah, he would be you know someone that I think is kind of falling through the cracks a little bit um, as more of an undervalued player. Um, I always lean, just personally lean towards uh, college bats. Um, uh, maybe it's, that's that's the um, the Cub fan and the uh, Theo Epstein in me. Um, if I can get a college bat, especially in like a like a deeply like something like a fifteen teamer like things like that, I always tend to lean towards the uh, college bats. Uh, I feel like the transition's a little bit easier towards the major league level. But Colton Ledbetter, someone that I have have had my eye on since. When, you know, also helped from Tampa Bay drafts you as well. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw Ledbetter at the end of the year last year. Oh, when nice, was in Charleston. Um, I honestly wasn't very impressed. I, I sorry. <laughs> no, that's uh, fine. I don't think there's a lot of impact there. Uh, his, I, you know, his data from college doesn't really support an average projection on his power. I think his power is going to be borderline, and I w didn't really see much at all in batting practice or when I saw him in games at all. Um, it's a very good approach, but you know, there's not a lot of speed either. So it's just if you're hoping for an above average to plus hit tool, and okay with not a ton of impact but in a corner i just it's a weird profile i don't know how it's going to necessarily move through the system with the rays the rays love the platoon platoon he's a lefty i think yeah. he could conceivably be developed into like a strong side option in the future that can give you like 15 home runs and you know like a two six two seventy ish average i think that's what he could be which is not bad i mean i yeah. think i think he's one of those players who is going to really hit well 
in the lower minors. Um, and I think he'll probably get assigned to somewhere like high A next year. And he'll probably destroy it. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he hits well in double A. It's just, I don't, I wonder where his ultimate ceiling is. See, that's why we have you on here, Jesse. We got boots on the <laughs> ground down in Charlestown, scouting that stuff live action. I don't, I don't have that ability. Love it. <laughs> I do. I mean, again, I don't dislike Ledbetter. Uh, I've, I've, there's been people I've seen in Charleston who I've seen, and I'm just like, nope. They're, they're not, not who we thought they were. <laughs> uh, he's, you know, fine. I just yeah. was not impressed. So Jesse, that's what we bring you on for. I'm going to bring up Kyle Teal. Don't say anything if you have anything <laughs> negative to say about him. <laughs> Don't crush his heart. Because big Red Sox homer. I was going to talk about Nazan Zan Zanatello, but I just want you to tell me that Kyle Teal will be my catcher for the next 10 years. I think Kyle Teal will be your catcher for the next 10 years. There we go. I do. That's it. And <laughs> um, you know, this, I think he ha he gives me a lot of like JT Real Muto feels. Woo. That's oh, what, man. I, mean, I think it's a very good defensive yeah. player. I think he's yeah. a fantastic athlete. Uh, he's a great hitter. You know, I don't think there's necessarily a boatload of power. That's but fine. There's enough. There's enough power. Um, and I think he's a good hitter. You know, I think the biggest questions you're going to see with hit with Teal are his approach. He's a bit aggressive at the plate, uh, but you know, I think it, I think he's going to move quickly. I could. I would yeah. not be shocked if we see him this year. Um, I. I think we're yeah. going to, especially because, like, it's Connor Wong, and it's, like, the, mm -hmm. it, there's just not – we. I just need to get rid of Connor Wong because he's the last remaining yeah. Mookie Betts piece, and then it's just, like, over with. But <laughs> I'm, I don't know why he fell in the draft in general, like, the way he fell. Mm -hmm. And there was a catcher pick before him. Like, there was just, like, a lot going on. But I'm um, definitely excited for him, and thank you for saying that he was going to be good. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think he's going to be a much better real life player than That's fantasy fine. player, but I think he'll be a good fantasy player. Um, generally, I would say this for fantasy with catchers, they're all they're all overrated for fantasy, mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. them, like yep. every single one, because impact the catcher impact is just not very much. The catchers don't provide a ton of impact in most formats. If you're in a one catcher format. There's great replacement value. You can find these find catchers on waivers. Even in a 20 team league, you can find plenty of good mm -hmm. catchers on waivers. Teams are not going to be rostering two catchers typically um, in formats that are not large, and yeah. so you're going to find catchers. They're they're going to be there, and the top catchers, people like JT Ramuso, they just don't produce a ton of value generally, um, even in their best years. They'll occasionally have like a Salvador Perez ridiculous season yeah. where he hit 48 home runs, but most of the time, I mean, even Ali Rushman, who everyone loves, who I love personally, I mean, he's a fantastic real life player. But I mean, he's what 270, 20 plus home runs. I mean, is that that great for fantasy? No, I mean, no, it's not. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, Kyle Teal might develop into like a 270. I'm using that batting average typically tonight, but <laughs> a 270 a shitter with like 15 home runs and a couple, a handful of stolen bases, and that's. Perfect. Good. That's perfectly happy. I'm happy with that. Um, but but again, I mean, are you trying to chase that necessarily in first year player drafts? I personally wouldn't be, especially since it's a really good first year player draft. That yeah. said, again, in deeper formats, if you're in two catcher format or deeper formats, all aboard, Kyle Teal. Thank you. Well, I think that's a good. I think that's a good transition to our next topic here. Uh, I think it'd be a good time. You know, everyone, everyone, everyone wants the initial immediate impact. Aside from the like obviously the international signees the yamamoto's the amagas do you see any of these guys let's say even in just you can see the shallow guys the top the top 15 guys or anyone for that matter it doesn't have to be top 15. do you guys do you see anyone that will make an impact or be in the bigs um this year in 2024 langford wild langford for sure oh, yeah. um i think he conceivably break breaks camp with the rangers i after the draft i was actually thinking that he can I said this on a podcast. I thought that, for one, I thought he would open the year with the Rangers this year. But I also thought that he conceivably could mm -hmm. make his debut last year and maybe be on the postseason roster. Um, it would made a lot of sense to me. Obviously, it didn't matter. Rangers still won the World Series. Uh, I think that you know there's a good chance he does break camp. That said, I you know I don't think the Rangers are necessarily rushing or 
to do it. I think there's been a lot of rumors or scuttlebutt that they may not be doing it to open the air. I think if he has a really strong spring, it's going to be really hard to not just bring him right up. But if he struggles in the spring, there's no reason. They just send him to triple A uh, or even double A. You know, I just let him kind of work his way, get his feet under himself, and then bring him up. But he's going to be up. I think he definitely will be. Uh, The next one, well, we mentioned Waldrop. I won't talk too much about that, but I do think that there's a chance we'll see him, you know, maybe in a relief role, but mm-hmm. it makes a lot of sense. He's, he debuted and he got up to AAA last year. I think yep. he definitely could make it to the majors this year very readily. I don't know what role he'll be in right away. I mean, the Braves right now have Bryce Elder as their number five, and he's, you know, he's a borderline major league starting pitcher. So I don't know if that's something that despite his obviously performance first half of last year, I don't know if that's like a long-term or even a short-term solution for the Braves. So I could see Walter supplanting him, but again, I just, I'm not really, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done with Walter and I'm not really convinced we're going to see him too early. You know, they're also going to make sure his innings are managed because he's a young pitcher and, they're going to probably want to have him for the playoffs as an option. So, you know, I could see him being definitely utilized some in relief to try and limit his innings. Uh, the other player who I guess is a dark horse as uh, a player, obviously there's no Nolan Shanuel. We don't need to go there. He's, mm-hmm. a, he's going to be in the majors. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, a dark horse. I think that could see time this year is Tommy Troy. Uh, he is, an infield prospect for the Diamondbacks. He actually had off-season surgery. Uh, he should be good to go by spring training. You know, the Diamondbacks, they could, they have, they sort of have a need in the infield. You know, he's very polished. I think he will move very quickly. Diamondbacks upper levels are a joke for hitters. So he should absolutely just destroy at Amarillo and uh, uh, the AAA, Diamondbacks AAA. I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but he'll destroy in those levels. Like he's going to just hit, 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 hit. So he's a player who's actually, I think, going to see early stock rises in for fan, for fantasy purposes if you're trying to just flip. But uh, I do see a chance for him to break in. You know, right now the Diamondbacks at third base, they have Eugenio Suarez, you know, who I really think is on his last legs. So mm-hmm. you know, I could definitely see Troy kind of, if there's an injury to like Suarez or Kettle Marte, who's off injured anyway, you know, he could definitely come in and slot in right away. Um, obviously, there's Jordan Lawler, who's in the queue, right? He's yep. s- sitting behind Perdomo. So he's also sort of in Damn. the mix uh, for that middle infield. So it's not necessarily a clear path for Troy, but I think we're going to probably see him at some point this year. And the last one I'd say is Matt Shaw uh, for Love the Cubs it. because, you know, Matt. The Cubs, they don't, they haven't really even fully committed to anybody at third base this year. Uh, Matt Shaw's played almost all of his reps in the offseason at third base. They're gearing him up to be the third baseman of the future. You know, right now, if you look at roster resource, <laughs> which I would not trust necessarily. I mean, it's a great re- it's a great resource, but <laughs> you know, don't don't take it at face value. But they have Nick Madrigal right now penciling at third base. I don't think anyone's really considering him as their starting third baseman. I think Christopher Morel will probably be the guy, or they'll put, you know, Michael Bush there when they have the right matchups to put him there. Uh, they'll have someone else there other than Nick, Nick Madrigal, who will be a utility guy, you know, perfectly yep. fine utility player. But I think there's just a clear path, nothing truly in the way for Shaw to just jump right up in there for the Cubs. And the Cubs are going to be competitive. So they're going to have incentive to bring him up if he's really performing. And I legitimately think that if he has a really strong spring, he could break camp. I, I'm not. I don't think it's outside the realm of possibilities. I think it's very low, but I think there's a chance. So I really think Matt Shaw is another guy who. It's a new day and age. We need to remember with, with yep. minor leagues, like the way the minor league systems are now organized, the incentive pick and everything. Teams just are going to be bringing players up a lot sooner. So, you know, I I would not be shocked if we see something like five. Made five players from this draft class wow. debut this year. That that'd be fantastic. <laughs> it would be. Yeah. You've made both mine and Nick's night tonight by saying Teal and Shaw are here in 2024. <laughs> Potentially, yeah. Potentially, I, I yeah. I'm not gonna, yeah, I'm not gonna hold you to it, but 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess this end out here with a couple, um, maybe more, maybe strategy questions is a good way to put them. Um, do you tend to shy away from pitchers and say like a shit? Let's not let's not talk thirty team. Let's talk the the normal consensus of like twelve, fifteen team leagues. Pitchers are, are those something that you see yourself avoiding, or are, or do you not do you not care about that? Uh I mean yes. I do try to avoid pitching in first year player drafts for a variety of reasons. You know, a lot of these pitchers, especially prep pitchers, they have to build innings like crazy. You know, they're, they're starting at what prep pitchers have like 40, 50 innings under the belt during their high school season or whatnot. And they have to build, 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 you know, there's so much risk of arm blowing out of like their stuff collapsing at a, under a, a bigger workload. Um, sometimes I think early reports on arms are incorrect I think that people still abide by old scouting metrics for assessing pitching quality, especially on the public facing stuff. It's just not accurate at all. Like someone like Noble Meyer. Let's talk about Noble Meyer briefly. Right. Yeah, let's do it. Everyone loves Noble Meyer. His fastball, everyone loves it. His fastball is a dead zone pitch that no one ever talks about. It's a it's a more of a dead zone pitch than Paul Skeen's fastball. Um, it's just not that great of a pitch honestly i think it's a pitch that's going to bull, bulldoze those young kids but i don't think it's i think there's going to ha- something's going to have to give on that fastball shape his breaking ball's ridiculous mind you like i think it's a very clear plus i think there's seven upside it's a ridiculous pitch he has some like jackson job type qualities job had slightly better fastball shape out of the draft uh job's fastball really transformed this year so that was a a big step for him. And I'm not saying that that's not possible for Meyer, but you know, that's something that we don't necessarily, that they don't, they just slap a six on that fastball and they move on. And I think that's just very incorrect. I think his fastball may just be like a five and, you know, they, I just don't, I don't really trust what you're going to see from like some of the big sites related to fastball quality or pitch quality. Generally, I think sometimes it's just off. And uh, especially with fastballs. But that said, yeah, I, do, I, I will try to avoid definitely prep pitchers. I do not want to touch them in first year player drafts. I mean, you could you could have gotten Jackson Job, who was what, second overall? Mm-hmm. You could have gotten him for a bargain into, heading into the mm-hmm. season, right? Yep. You know, it's there's so much developmental time lead up to, before they actually have an impact, and there's so mm-hmm. much risk involved that's just not worth it. Now, someone like a Paul Skeens, I'm not avoiding someone like that. Um, right. because I think that it's going to be impact that soon. He already has a ton of innings anyway, so he's going to be ready to come in and potentially – I didn't mention him in 2024 because I'm not super sold that it's going to happen. Uh, so, you know, I I don't mind drafting someone like Paul Skeens, but, yeah, I mean, ideally p- hitting just because pitching comes with a ton of more risk. Um, mm-hmm. I did mention Ty Floyd earlier. love Ty yep. Floyd but I wouldn't really do Ty Floyd in a smaller format, especially if you're only rostering like 200 prospects or something like that. That's mm. a league. There's no point. So I typically would just go hitting, 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 hitting. Um, I, that's usually how you should do prospects anyway. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're all in, in consensus on that one. I think I'll, I'll kind of with that same uh, concept with the proximity and things like that, where do you value like, international or J15 players in, in first year player drafts, like with, you know, these 16, 17 year old guys, um, which again, um, the, the, the slow burn or the, the waiting game for these guys, where, where it's one point on like a shallow or 12, 15 team, are you looking to grab like even the, even the number one uh, ranked J15 guy. In a shallower league, I'd only draft one this year. It'd be uh, Leo DeVries. That's it. Um, just mm-hmm. because the reports on him are so, some of them are so uh, ecstatic that, and especially since now we're seeing, you know, these complex leagues start earlier in the year, mm-hmm. you're going to get early returns. You're going to get returns on them earlier than you would in the years past. I mean, in some years it was like July, we pushed up till June last year. And then this year it's going to be in May. So you're just missing like a month of, of, uh, you know, data. That's why I actually ended up drafting Jose Perdomo in my, the, our 30 teamer, just because, you know, I'm going to get returns from him earlier. I don't have to wait as long. Um, I really don't like drafting. Uh, I don't like drafting these players. I don't like drafting yep. 16, 17 year old players. Cause for one, the reports are all wrong. Every single one of them are wrong. Like 
MLB pipeline, everybody ha is like a 55 or a 50 or a 60. <laughs> That's literally, you'll just see 55, 55, 55 yeah. across the board. It's just wrong. You can't really trust the reports at all on on these players because some of them are really old. Some of them are like a year old. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the signing bonuses those are from a year ago. So those players have developed a lot over a year. So you know maybe someone like Rodomo was worth five million a year ago, but now you know he has his body's changed. You know, he's not necessarily the same player he was a year ago. Mm -hmm. So you can't even trust the bonuses. I really just don't think it's good process to be leaning on anybody's take on these types of players at all. Like none of them. I don't trust any of them. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right. It. So I just avoid. I don't I don't typically. Of course I took Prodomo, but I typically avoid these players altogether. Uh, I yep. think it's just not good process. You're always gonna find these players pop up. You know, yep. someone like Jackson Chirillo was not drafted in first year player drafts outside of maybe, maybe some 30 team leagues. He wasn't, you know, someone mm -hmm. like Sebastian Walcott, he was drafted in 30 teamers, but he wasn't drafted in shallower formats. He was a player that was available on waivers. Most of these players are going to be available on waivers. You just wait until, you know, the season starts, you see some early returns, you see some people, you know, s talking mm -hmm. about their data or their exit velocities or, you know, some reports that are coming in that are really loud about these players. You know, they, we were hearing reports about Ethan Salas in spring training last year. They're really loud reports, you know, that's when you start to jump on these players. And, you know, you can trade for these players. Mm -hmm. You don't have to draft these players. <laughs> so, you know, trading is a big thing in Dynasty, and no one should be shy or shy away from it. Uh, you know, if you do shy away from it, you're just not going to move your team forward. And so, you know, I just think that why take a risk on it in 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 a draft when you can typically get players that are going to be able to – you'll see – returns from them immediately in April the season starts you're going to see the first week of play you get to look at the stats look Ty Pete is is you know, three for five today uh and the hell's the player I was considering when I, was, <laughs> yeah. when I took Perdomo uh so then you can kind of like build hype for these players and then flip because yeah. I again I try to use my my minor league or minor league system to turn it into major league talent yeah, and I think that was just a good topic because if you look around like the major league level, like a lot of the you know big name superstars and and productive players come from that. Well, it used to be J two signing, but J fifteen signing. So it's like, but you don't want to buy in at, at seventeen years old. So it's they it's all just always a uh, most of them were unknown. Yep, like someone yep. like Ronald Acuna Jr. was not a player that was drafted. Someone like yep. Juan Soto was. Yeah. Drafted in maybe a handful of leagues in deep leagues. He wasn't drafted in shallower formats. You know, yes, someone like Vlad Guerrero Jr. was drafted, but he's Vlad, he's Vlad, Vlad Guerrero's yeah, son. Yeah, exactly. Was drafted. Wander Franco was drafted for those who did that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there was, there's most of these players that are the biggest names from international market, a lot of them just were not drafted. They're players yep. you can pick up on waivers. So just be hyper vigilant in season and pounce yeah i, I think it's a great point because like i said a lot, a lot of times these these rankings come out and these even if people go to like mlb pipeline they see that top 100 international they see that mm -hmm. the top five like oh i gotta draft this guy at some point in my draft just because he's ranked high but i think it's always it's a it's a good point just you know don't do that don't draft them <laughs> yeah. at all i just don't <laughs> Draft them almost, you know, unless the value is just like perfect, right? Perfect, yeah, you can draft them, but otherwise, just I would avoid them. You know, I, I I'm saying all this. I just drafted Jose. <laughs> it's, a little, it's a little bit, like, little bit different, though. It's a little bit different. Frustrated that I did that. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's it's a way different situation. It's a 30 team. Yeah, uh, it's a very uh disciplined league. So I think it's it's nothing wrong with that pick there, but. <laughs> Before we get you out of here, I ask everyone, I ask Chris Blessing, I ask everybody else, before we get you out of here, who, I mean, obviously this, this is a tee up here, but who, if you have the 1-1 one, one in this year's first year player draft, who's your pick? Well, it depends, but typically I would be taking Y Langford. If you're in a points league, you know, Yoshinobu Yamamoto, I would really strongly consider because I really buy, I'm fully bought in on him. You know, I was bought in before, but I think the, the his landing spot with the Dodgers, uh, it just completely sold me at this point because he's going to give you everything you want out of a starter. His yeah. performance, we've not seen it come out. That type of performance 
come from the poem freshman baseball to major league baseball ever. We've not seen it. He's performed better than any pitcher has ever come over. Uh, I think his floor is someone like Masahiro Tanaka. I think he has, you know, you Darvish type ceiling and be, maybe even beyond. I think it's just ridiculous stuff. Uh, his release point and his extension combined with his fastball velocity and its shape at times give it, I think it has a seven ceiling here. It's a good pitch. I think sometimes the velocity backs up. It averages around 95 miles an hour. Very good pitch. Uh, his curveball is, you know, re, you know, it's not maybe the tradition, the type of curveball that modern uh, analytics love. You know, it sits in the upper 70s, about 77 miles an hour, mid to upper 70s, with a boatload of movement, tons of depth and sweep. You know, what's atypical about the pitch is he has such fantastic command of it and he throws it for like 77 70 percent strikes which is just unheard of you don't see that and yeah. then of course there's the splitter which is uh which most pitchers in the bone professional baseball have these days and it's a great pitch it has huge vol depth variation from his fastball it's something like i i don't have it off the top of my head but it's something like 12 to 15 inches of break more break induced for a break than his fastball it's ridiculous. And the and it comes in around 90 miles an hour. So I think it's going to miss a ton of bats. I think the fastball will miss bats. And he has ridiculous command. I'm not afraid of taking him in top 50 in redraft. I'm not afraid of doing that. Definitely not afraid of doing that in dynasty. I think he automatically enters as a top 10 dynasty arm. But again, he's an arm. He doesn't have the upside of someone like Wyatt Langford, who I really think could be something like a Ryan Braun uh, at the major league level. Um, pretty quickly Love i think that. he's really special what, what he did in his debut is we just don't see it typically that's high mm -hmm. performance right away um the he does literally everything you want from from a hitter he hits for power real you know it's, it's plus plus raw uh he gets to a ton of inning games he makes a ton of contact he has very good plate discipline I think the biggest question is how much speed he'll provide, how if he's going to be a, a provide some stolen bases. But even if he doesn't, I mean, he's still a player who's going to give you average on base percentage, and home runs, and of course run production. And if the, even if the speed is like ten stolen bases, I mean, I think there's a chance. There's a chance that the speed gets is is bigger because he is he is fast. He's just not a very he's not necessarily the best base runner. So there's a chance that he could get you twenty plus stolen bases too at peak. So it, it's just a huge upside here. He's probably the, I mean, I, we have him as the number one overall prospect in baseball right now. A lot of people do. Mm -hmm. I just think his upside, his proximity, um, I think his floor, all of it just aligns to make him low risk and ridiculously high mm -hmm. reward, similar to Yamamoto, but just is a hitter. So yep. if you're going to take, if you're going to do that in most formats, I'd go Yamamoto or go Langford, but in points, especially if you're in a, win now position i think yamamoto mm -hmm. is a player i really strongly consider but i i still do prefer langford generally awesome man i love it i love all the content you brought up tonight uh really always again always insightful everything you bring super knowledgeable i love i love getting to talk, talk to you about all this uh mind league stuff it's great man why don't you go ahead and uh let everyone know where they can find you what you got going on and stuff like that well you can find me at baseball prospectus i will i usually put out articles on fridays uh, my Twitter is J A R O C H E six, and I, I'm not as active in the off season, but in season I'm fairly active on Twitter. Um, and well, X, whatever it is now, <laughs> it's not even what it was. It's such a weird site these days. It's so but bad. We still have to use it, so yep, yep. <laughs> it's what it is. But obviously, baseball perspectives. It's not just me over there. So please subscribe. There's a great fancy team there. We do a, obviously it, the background of baseball perspectives is it's one of the pioneering sites for prospect analysis and excellent baseball writing generally. So there's a lot of just fantastic articles. They invent amazing metrics over there. There's just a great analytical team at Baseball Prospectus. So I do just one small thing on this site. And uh, but so subscribe for all of the awesome, awesome content that's provided. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to age myself too much, but uh, Baseball Prospectus is what got me like hooked when I first started playing Dynasty, like they were my go-to um, resource, and I can remember getting the like massive like book. Or I don't know if it was a book or what it was. It was just like it was like 
it was like the only you never saw anything like it. It was like a like a like a what do they used to call them? The guys been so long since they they don't have them anymore. Not not a dictionary, but um a handbook encyclopedia encyclopedia yeah, it was like yeah, an encyclopedia yeah. and baseball perspective was doing that and like i said i don't want to i don't want to age myself but uh baseball we perspective do it. We yeah do it. it's we have a future guy as well top notch man it's top notch I, like i said that was my go-to resource first started playing dynasty back in the day and it's great stuff like, like you said so um thanks again for coming on jesse thanks for having me guys it's always it. always a pleasure and thanks guys when then uh, we'll see you guys next week